All right, well, good morning, Redeemer. My name is uh, Keenan Harris. I'm one of the pastors on staff here, and happy Palm Sunday. And before we get into the text, I think it'd be, even in light of like the tru- some of the truths that we've read in Romans, to even just pause um, and pray uh, for the shooting that happened in Nashville. Um, and so will you do that with me? Let's pray. That God, we come before you. Um, and in situations like this, a lot of it, God, that is uh, Romans 8 comes to mind that we don't know what to pray, that we feel the groanings and we feel like the longings of this is not as it should be. And so, God, we sit in that, that this is not um, your design, um, and we don't know what to pray. But God, also in light of what we read last week, Romans 12, that says we weep with those who weep, we grieve with those who grieve. Um, and so, we grieve, and God, we ask that you would draw near and bring peace and bring comfort um, to those who um, are struggling and mourning and grieving. And even what we're going to look at today, God, we thank you for the people that you used to intervene. Um, we know that that's your design, too. And so, God, we just ask for your help. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we are continuing. Um, through our sermon series through the book of Romans, that if you haven't been with us, we're reading the Bible together, we're reading the book of Romans devotionally together, and we're also preaching it, that, you know, what you need to understand and what you need to remember is that the book of Romans, like, we kind of read it in these little sections, that we kind of look at it and we think, okay, now we're going to focus on these seven verses, but what you need to remember is that this is a letter that would have been read in its entirety, and so what Paul has been doing is Romans 1 through 11, he's building these big, rich, theological, doctrinal truths about who God is and what he's done. He's talking about that we are saved by grace through faith alone in Jesus' life, death, and and resurrection. And then there's this pivot, there's this shift in Romans 12, that it'll be on the screen there, but there's this shift that in light of all these truths, there should be a renewal in our minds. There should be this transformation in us that we're transformed by the grace of God. And so 12 through 16, 16 are the so what of these theological doctrinal truths. And he's building on this, like, what does it look like to be a living sacrifice, worshipful to God in all areas of life? And the snapshot we're going to be looking at today is how we relate to governments and governing authorities. And so it's going to be a lot of fun. All right, so I want to look at, I want to read it in its entirety so you know the context, all right? Romans 13, verses 1 through 7 says this. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed." And so in my experience, there are like three kind of like topics that tend to make people kind of defensive or what I like to call like spiritually bow up. That would be like uh, sexuality, money, and government, okay? And so, um, and I wonder if that kind of tells us what we tend to idolize. Um, But because of that, I want to get ahead of some potential like defeaters and things that you are already maybe thinking in your head. That first of all, this is not an exhaustive passage on how we should conduct ourselves within a government. And so as a result, this isn't going to be an exhaustive sermon on all the nuances. That this passage doesn't provide a lot of the nuance needed. Now, you got to remember that Paul makes this big shift in chapters 12. And, and, and specifically, I think 12 and 13 read a lot like Wisdom literature. So wisdom literature, that's just a genre in the Bible. Like think the book of Proverbs where there's there's these general guiding ideal principles that we should live by and value, but they don't have a lot of the nuances and context needed. And so as a result, okay, this passage is not saying that we should obey evil commands. 
that there are passages in the Bible, there are examples in the Bible where people obey the word of God and people obey God's commands and it causes them to disobey earthly laws and commands. And also, finally, this passage is not saying that all governments or all governing authorities are like perfect, moral, and never do anything wrong. Okay, it's not saying that, and we know that that's not true. There are governments historically and presently, there are governing authorities historically and presently that have done wicked, horrible, evil things. Either as a government, they've done horrible, wicked, evil things, or individuals in government, in governing authorities, have done these things. But, okay, even, that, even though that's the case, the general principles we're going to see in this passage still apply even if the government or even if the governing authorities are wicked and immoral, that if you want to go read it, we're not going to read it, but go look at 1 Peter 2, 18 through 25. It even says that if you are submitted, you should submit to one that is even treating you unjustly. And he gives motivation for us there. But you have to also have to think about the context of this letter. What's the name of this book? Romans. Okay, so this is written to people in Rome, believers in Rome, under the Roman rule and eventually Roman persecution. This, yes, the same government that that crucified and put Jesus on the cross. Yes, the same government that put Christians and other people into gladiator games, the same government that eventually kills the author of this letter, Paul. So the principles still apply. So we good? There's my disclaimers. All right, let's jump in. Um, 13 verse 1 says this. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Okay, so we're going to stop here because this is significant. This is the premise that Paul is laying out here, that anybody that is in authority is there because God has placed him or her there. And I want you to look at the absolutes even in this one sentence that let every person, every single person be subject to governing authorities, for there is no authority authority except from God, that these absolutes that God has put these people in place. And this is not the only place in the Bible where this idea is mentioned. Here, look at four different uh, passages. Daniel 2 says this, he changes times and seasons. He removes kings and he sets up kings. First Peter 2, 13 and 14, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him. Um, John 19, these are Jesus' words. When, the, right before he's about to be crucified, he's on trial. He says to Pilate, which is like a governor, our equivalent of a governor. So Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you is the greater sin, which is just a bar because what Jesus is saying is like, the only reason you have authority is because I'm the one that put you in authority over me, which is just awesome. And then Romans 9 um, that we covered earlier this semester for scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. And I think this is beautiful because what it gives us, it gives us this snapshot of an attribute of God, his sovereignty. That yes, I tend to think of God's sovereignty kind of in like the cosmos level of like he's sovereign over creation. He's sovereign in the general plan for the world. He's sovereign in salvation. But I tend to neglect the fact that he is even sovereign in the everyday levels of our life like governing authorities. Yes, on the big level, but even like on the local level, that he is sovereign. And why does he care? Why does he institute these governing officials? To, do, to bring justice, protection, and order. Look at the verses two through four in Romans 13 again. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. For those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrong, wrongdoer. That he does these things because he cares about justice, order, protection. You see that in verse 4, that he, the governing authority, is God's servant for your good. And then later in that verse, he says that these things happen, that there are consequences to protect people. 
that, that verse four go, even goes so, so far to say that the punishment for those who break the law are experiencing not just the consequences of earthly laws, but even God's wrath. That God is just. God is the God of complete and holy justice. That this means that he has instituted governments to be an extension of executing his justice. That later in verse 6, it says these people are even ministers of God. Not in the sense of like a pastor, but in the sense of executing his will. That yes, God is just in salvation. That he poured out his wrath for sin on Jesus instead of us, which is just a beautiful doctrine that we've covered um, extensively in this series. But he, and then we know that he's going to judge the world wholly and completely one day. But he also executes justice here on earth. And there are several of you in here um, that have been like seriously hurt or harmed or abused by other people in your past. And look, one, the end of chapter 12 says that there will be a day where vengeance will be had. That there will be a day that God cares about his justice and that will be executed eternally and they will have to stand before God and face that. That that can be a form of peace, knowing that God sees that and he cares about it. And there will be a day where vengeance will be his, it says at the end of Romans 12. But also, if and when there has been like criminal action or consequences taken against them, that is God executing wrath. That is God executing justice on your behalf. And so further, like another one I want you to think about just for a second, is another characteristic of, of God that we see here is that he's not chaotic. That with God, there is order, there is peace. And we see that there, that he cares about it, that he created the world with order, structure, and order. And I want you to think about all the way back at creation, what was the first command given to Adam and Eve? Well, if you go to Genesis 128, it wasn't, do not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That wasn't the first one. The first one was to be fruitful, multiply, take dominion over the earth, and seek to subdue it. He commissions them to go and bring order and maintain order and bring peace to my world and my earth. He cares about it. He cares about there being order and peace to his earth and the lives of his people. And he does this by instituting these governing authorities. So let's keep going, verses 5 through 7. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this thing, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all who, what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. Now these verses made me think of Jesus' own words. That I want you to look at Matthew 22. It will be on the screen here. Jesus says this or this, this story that surrounds Jesus. Verse 15. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully and you do not care about anyone's opinion for you're not swayed by appearances. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why do you put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. See, we look at this interaction, we think, okay, that's cool, that kind of makes sense. But I don't want us to miss the significance and the beauty of what Jesus is doing here. That what you need to understand is that there's an unlikely pairing here that happens. You have the Pharisees and you have the Herodians. Herodians, by nature, you can see it in their name, they were Roman sympathizers. Romans, Herodians, Herod, that they loved the government. They sympathized with the Roman government. The Roman Empire was over, was ruling the Jews at that time, and so they would have sympathized with the Romans. And then Pharisees, they were anti-Roman, anti-Caesar, that they wanted to abide only and solely by the religious laws, and so they would have been at odds, but they kind of join arms together to try to trap Jesus here. That either he's going to say something that's going to make the Jews even more mad, that he's going to be pro-Caesar, or he's going to say something that's going to get him killed by the Roman Empire. Okay, But what Jesus says here is beautiful. 
that he says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God, that he is giving us this right political theology. That what he did in that statement is he established the validity of human governments while setting its limits. That he established the validity of human governments while setting its limits. That we, as people of God, we're going to give to Caesar what God calls us to give to Caesar, but we're not going to give to Caesar what God calls us to only give to him. And I want you to look at some things that Paul and Jesus give us here. So the first thing that we should render to Caesar is submission to authorities in obedience to earthly laws. Because here's the thing that we're going to tend to do sinfully. We're either not going to give enough validity or not going to give to Caesar what we should, or we're going to give too much, not have boundaries, not have limits on what we're going to give to these governments. So the first thing, we're going to render to Caesar submission to authorities and obedience to earthly laws. That your obedience to earthly laws matter. That we should be, as people of God, good citizens. That why in like middle school and high school did we kind of make fun of the kid that won best citizenship? I don't know why we did that. Maybe we were jealous. Um, But like we tend to do that, but obedience matters. We should be good citizens. Look at verse 2. Therefore, who resist the authorities, resist what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. That when you resist governing authorities and you break the law, you are resisting God. That later on in verse 5, it says, when we resist these authorities, when we break the law, it warrants not just earthly consequences, but God's wrath on you. And so, yes, we should pay our taxes. That, yes, even though it feels like a made-up number that if you, once you hit submit, I know the accountant's a little cringing here on TurboTax, once you hit submit, you're convinced the IRS is going to show up because you did something wrong. Like, yes, pay even those taxes, That yes, even if you think they're going to use it for unholy, wicked purposes. Yes, even those taxes, pay them. That look, you have to remember who Jesus and Paul, the time they were in. That all throughout the story surrounding Jesus, tax collectors were known as deceitful, wicked people. That the Jews at that time, they didn't want to pay their taxes because what they would do is they would overcharge and steal some from, for themselves and take some for themselves. Yes, paying even those taxes. That, look, I think the majority of us in here, we think we're good in this area. And maybe, maybe we are, okay? But just a quick one that where we see a root issue for all of us, myself included, That, for example, that there, with all of us, there are some rules, there are some laws that we are flat out tempted to refuse to obey and to break. That, for example, I think driving in New Mexico is just the worst because driving 65 in the middle of the nowhere, middle of nowhere makes no sense to me. And so what happens is, is because I think that's a dumb law, I'm not going to obey it. And I'm going to drive the speed that I think that makes the most sense for me, and I'm going to do that. And yes, there are consequences that I've experienced before, but what do you think, what's going on in my heart here is I think I should be the authority. I think that I know best because I know best I'm going to do what I feel is best for me. And this is in all of us that we've inherited from Adam and Eve, that a couple weeks ago I walked into a fight between two of my kids, and I don't know what the who, who cares what, the, what, what they're fighting over? But anyway, I walk in, and what I hear them yelling back and forth is, no, I rule you. No, I rule you. No, I rule you. And me, in all of my maturity and sanctification, I come in and say, no, I rule both of you. Sit down, and we're going to talk about this, right? That you, We're all clamoring for power. We're all clamoring for authority. And we don't want to be in submission to anybody. We don't want anybody telling us what to do. And though it's not the context of this passage, that we have an authority issue in all areas of our life, that the Bible talks about submitting to our workplace. The Bible talks about honoring and submitting to our parents. The Bible talks about even being in submission to one another, that we don't like to do that, that we buck up against that, that we bristle anytime anybody tries, us to, tell, t- tries to tell us what to do. And the problem is, and I think what that shows in us, my, my curiosity is, is when we kind of push against authorities, I think we're resisting the authority of God. That we don't even like 
God telling us what to do. We don't want God to tell us how to spend our money, how to spend our time, what to value, what to love. That this is what Paul is trying to get us. And on the flip side of this, we render to Caesar submission and authority, submission and obedience to earthly laws. But again, Caesar and governing authorities are not the final authority. That we render to only to God submission to him as final authority in complete obedience to God's word as ultimate. Like I said at the beginning, we do not obey evil commands or commands that contradict what God calls us to do. That Paul would break laws that said he couldn't proclaim Jesus as Lord. That if Matthew 28 says that we are to go therefore and make disciples of all nations... What happens when there are nations and there are people groups and there are that their government tells them that being a Christian is illegal? Well, we still go. We still proclaim that message. You have examples from the Old Testament like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that would not bow down and worship a human king and they get thrown into an earth, they get thrown into a furnace. Or you have Daniel where it was illegal to pray, but yet he did that and he gets thrown into the lion's den. You have Moses' mother hid Moses from the genocide, right? That you have the wise men, they didn't obey Herod and go back and tell them, him where Jesus was. Um, in, in Acts 5, you have governing officials telling Peter to stop preaching, and he says, which I think is a good summary of this in Acts 5.29, but Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. So of course, that God supersedes earthly authorities and we obey his word first. And I know there are people here in attendance that you have even like wrestled with and maybe even left your job because your place of employment was telling you to do things that, were, that would contradict God's word, that you made a hard decision, difficult decision to walk away from that, that we don't give to governing authorities ultimate and final authority. Like that belongs to God. That second here, we do render to Caesar, though, respect and honor, that even if we res- disagree with those in authority of us, we still owe them respect and honor. Look at Romans 13, 7. Pay to all what is owed them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. And I think there are two different people that this would apply to. At one, there's a person in here, that a type of person in here who doesn't care about government or politics. Okay? And that's okay to an extent. Because I think what this is calling an an, an invitation for you here is you should give respect, you should give honor, you should care in, in the sense that there's an invitation for you to be aware and involved in the political mechanisms available to you. That we are called as people of God to be salt and light where God has placed us. And so that involves knowing what's going on, knowing the dark places, and that includes like politics and that includes governing things that we need to be aware of and be able to speak into what the word of God would call us to do that we're not going to read it but in Jeremiah 29 7 it even says that basically when they've been the people of uh, Israel have been taken captive by the people of Babylon basically their political nation has been taken away they don't have a king they've been taken away as a political entity a sovereign nation he says even submit to that Um, pagan nation and seek the welfare of even that city, that seek the benefit of even that city where you are in exile. So we should be, we should respect and we should honor our government and our country enough that we should be salt and light seeking the welfare of it. But two, on the other side of it, there's a person that does care about government and politics, but is constantly tearing down and demeaning people they disagree with. And look, you and I have every right to disagree with the government, governing authorities over us, but the political discourse right now is just burn it down if you disagree with me. I'm going to not just burn it down, but I'm going to burn you down. I'm going to take to social media, I'm going to gossip, make fun of, and demean, and we're going to tear them down. And look, here's the thing, Romans 12 still applies to you. That even when you disagree with the person in office above you, Romans 12 still applies to you. That in the way that you're talking about the things that you disagree with, are you still letting love be genuine? Are you still seeking to live peaceably with all? 
Are you still not reviling where you shouldn't be reviling? Are you still trying, are you re- trying to repay evil for evil? That all of our political discourse, even with other believers, is just to tear down and to demean if you disagree with me. That we kind of unite eat more so on political party than we do on the blood of Jesus. And I'm going to demean and I'm going to tear you down if you disagree with me. That I don't think that's what this is calling us to do, right? That even Jesus gave respect and honor to the governing authorities that would send him off to be crucified. That we render to Caesar respect and honor that is owed. But we render only to God, that other side of the uh, table, worship, hope, and dependence. That while we are called to respect and honor governing authorities, we're not called to worship them. We're not called to put all of our hope, all of our sense of dependence on them. That's something to consider here, okay? That the people of Israel, the time of Jesus, they would have thought that the Messiah was going to come and be this like political Messiah. They thought he was going to come in like this conquering warrior, this king who would come and overthrow the Roman Empire, overthrow the government to reestablish them as this like sovereign nation. And that's why they respond the way they do on Palm Sunday. Today is Palm Sunday, right? The, way they, the reason why they uh, respond with celebration and excitement and the palm branch that we have no idea what they look like, like all those things, like the reason they respond that way is they thought, this is it. We're finally gonna be out from underneath the Roman Empire. The rebellion is happening. We're gonna get to finally be our own sovereign nation. We're gonna kick them out. And the reason they respond so hatefully a week later is because he doesn't meet that expectation. So they kill him for it. And I wonder how many of us think the political governing authority is going to be our savior, that Jesus did not come and set up a political dynasty or a ruling nation. He came to save a people for himself, that your political party is not your savior. That person you want in office is not your savior. And some of us show how much we worship government and politics by how consumed you are by it and by how much your sense of security and your sense of hope ebbs and flows depending on the status of your political party. That my fear is that some of us are more concerned with the state of our country than we are with the state of our own souls. And I'm not saying you shouldn't be concerned about the state of our country, But are you more concerned about that than you are about the state of your own souls? That through faith in Jesus, Jesus is your Savior. Jesus alone is who we worship. Jesus alone is who we should put our hope and our sense of dependence on. Look at Colossians 1, 15 and 16. He is the image of the, this is talking about Jesus, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, Look at this. He created these things, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. So yes, he created these thrones and these dominions and these rulers and these authorities. Why? To bring glory to him that they are still in subjection to him. He is the final authority. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the ruler of rulers. That he is preeminent. And so the question comes to us, are we living for this kingdom or are we living for his eternal kingdom? Do we, are we putting the limits that God has called us to put limits on human government and looking to the earthly, sorry, the eternal heavenly kingdom? And finally, we're going to render to Caesar prayers for Caesar. And I bring this point because it brings a very tangible, practical application for us. Look at 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. This is Paul in a different letter. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful, quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. This is important, and this doesn't just apply to like governing authorities. I think it applies in every area of our life. But we should pray for those who are in high positions over us because it's really hard to vilify someone that you're praying for. It's really hard to demean someone that you are 
praying for, to disrespect, to resist those that you pray for, that Paul is calling us to pray for those who are in high positions and that God would use them to bring peace to our lives. That when Jesus teaches us to pray in Matthew 6, that we should pray that God's kingdom would come and his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And one of the ways that he brings his kingdom to earth is through governing authorities. And so we should thank God for the authorities in our lives. Yes, even the ones we didn't vote for. That we should pray to them, pray for them. Even the ones we disagree with, we should pray for them. That This is pleasing to God. But we should render only to God prayers to God. And this is somewhat obvious, but it needs to be said. You're not praying to and putting all of your hope and all of your dependence in a politician or a governing official. That our prayers are to God and God alone. We do not pray to governing authorities and put our dependence and hope on them. We pray to the one who institutes them. We pray to the one who is our final and ultimate authority. So here's how I want to wrap this up. That if Romans 12 says that the mercy of God and the grace of God brings renewal and transformation to all of our lives... This includes how we interact with governing authorities. The grace of God allows us to put governing authorities in its rightful place, deserving of honor and respect and submission, but not what we worship, not what we put our hope. That we can render to Caesar, we can render to these things submission, respect, and honor and prayers for, all the while rendering only to God, seeing him as the one true ultimate authority by which all of our hope, all of our worship is for. He is sovereign, he is just, he is good, and he is the God of peace and order. That is who we're living for. That is the king that we worship. Let's pray. God, we come before you um, and we submit to you um, as ultimate authority. God, you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And God, we trust you and we need you um, and we love you. And so God, reveal to us where maybe we've been putting our hope in other kings. God, reveal to us where we've been not submitting to authority and as a result, not submitting to your authority in our life. And God, even right now, we do pray for the men and women who are in authority over us. You've placed them there. God, I pray that you would use our government um, to bring peace, to bring order, that we would live quiet and godly lives because of the order and the peace that uh, that you want to bring through them. God, we pray for them, that you would use them as you see fit. But God, help us to be a people living for your kingdom not earthly kingdoms. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.